that's a bruised shoulder right there. Yeah, that's that's a bruised fire. shoulder. Yeah. Alright Dennis, you wanna you wanna fire it? Oh go ahead. Alright. I will. I'll see you later. Oh my gosh. I'm not gonna take this out all day with plugs. Oh no. That that hurts. That hurts. But is that all you have is slugs? No, I only brought ten. I, I was not in I was not in the shooting the slugs every all day. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. Yeah. Yep. So obviously the cut's not perfect. So you can see that's where you got a high side. Okay. Yeah. And then you don't have a a perfect fit up. Mm hmm So we can kind of find where our cut isn't perfect on both sides and find the alignment. Cool. Because so you have that gap closed up. That's cool. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. So we got yeah. the angles facing yeah. The opposite ways. So then it all it fits fills up the, yeah. parallel. Cool. So now we can tack it. And I'm going to switch my tungsten out. So, if you want to look at this. filler rod mm -hmm. that's also going to cool my joint even more so mm -hmm. i might have to turn the welder up a little bit oh okay so when you introduce a filler rod it's not being heated it okay it cools the joint down so. that makes sense you're adding more material yeah obviously <laughs> really the joint quality at all because mm -hmm. we're just trying to see what's going on with it but the big thing is it's stuff on the inside right you gotta make sure that there's limited penetration mm -hmm. so you can see on that first one we blew through and material sank through yep and that's also kind of what happened when we got this going because mm -hmm. we we're heating it yep so anyway we're gonna want to focus on that we'll kind of pull it in check kind of how straight everything is so right now you can see there's that little gap mm -hmm. um, which yeah I can see it you can see it coming through mm -hmm. it's touching on the ends so that means our, our ends are higher so what we could do is move this in a little bit and see if that helps clean it out so then you can see that gap's almost gone yep it's kind of lifting that one end or what we could do is kind of feel like maybe that might help us out a little bit. Still a little lower. So you just want to get the fit up as, as good as you possibly can before you start welding on it because yep. you know metal likes to move once it gets hot. Mm -hmm. So if you can get it, you know, really, really close, then then you're not gonna have issues. So what we'll probably do is get one tack on it mm -hmm. so that it's not moving around once we're happy. And then um, and then we'll kind of tune it up. Yeah. Basically we'll go over and move it if we need to. But I'd like to get this side to come up a little bit more. So not that much. It would also been easier back for you know. So that looks good and good enough for me to get attacked on it. So I'll get something from it. 
And if you get it tacked a few times, then we can like put it together and see if it actually works. And now that it's tacked, it's kind of just where it's going to be, right? Well, a little bit. Kind of. Um, obviously, we can still. There's like. Stuff we can there. still decide what to do with it mm -hmm. um, at this point. But we want to get that sitting down on there again mm -hmm. and make sure everything's in the same and make sure this gap hasn't changed. You know, because if it mm -hmm. was showing a gap there, it would mean that it was kind of. Yeah. It pulled on the other side. So that's why we're going to double check. You know, our our alignment still looks good. Mm -hmm. we'll make sure it's clean. But so, you know, we don't have like a, a rocking. There's mm -hmm. like a tiny, tiny rocking here, but I think by the time we tack this, mm -hmm. it's gonna pull in a little bit and help that other side out. If it was like a pretty good arc on the top, yeah. you know, if there was a big peak, then we would want to avoid tacking it up until we fix it. But with this, I think we're good enough to move forward. So. Get another tack on there. So you leave the argon blowing on it until it cools down? Yep, you want to help it shield until it's not necessarily, it helps cool it, it helps mm -hmm. it keep it cool, mm -hmm. but it's also keeping it from getting contaminated. Yeah. So oxides can't build. So at that point, you know, we've got our, our one, two tax, yeah. and you can look down it, and it doesn't look like it's got a weird bend, bend to in it. it. Like you can sight down this way mm -hmm. and want to make sure it's not leaning, because that's going to cause binding for yep. you. So that all looks good to me. It does look like maybe there's a little bit of a lift in it this way. So we can check that. Yeah, so you can see there's a gap there. Oh, interesting. So it's been tacked this way, so mm -hmm. it's straight that way. But not the other, because it this leaned way, the other way. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. see how much it lifted? Yep. And that gets more and more dramatic the further Before out goes, you get. Yep. So we would want to remedy that if we can. Can you, like bend it a little like can you mess with it yeah a we bit? just don't want to go so far that we break our tacks yeah but we're definitely going to want to try and pull that into shape because yep. that's you know that's yep. obviously not ideal so we'll do the lazy one first and just clamp it in here and hopefully put enough flex on it that it doesn't over bend it you know what I mean? Mm hmm. You hear it crunching. <laughs> yeah, it's just my soft oh. jaws, I think. So we can kind of check it. It helped it out a little bit, but we need to go a little further. Mm. So, because we still got a peak right there. me up an extension tube for this this is a big old piece of pvc as a, as a temporary uh, shim basically and we're going to put in as many of these these are kind of oversized so this gun doesn't really like them um, they're a little bit bigger than two and three quarter inch so we're gonna see empty gun empty chamber you see good good start putting them in so one two three four Five, six, seven, eight, 
nine. So mine's an auto 10, <laughs> not an auto seven or an auto five. And then we'll try. We'll see. I did. I made a mistake and degreased this gun with, with brake cleaner. So I, I don't think it liked that because it was malfunctioning. And uh, so here we're going to see if it will just actually eject these. I have to do it really hard. It doesn't like doing this with those oversized snap caps. So it might malfunction. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, Oh my god, it works. I actually really believe it would do that. So, uh, success? Question mark? Thank you. Goodbye. It's hot. I don't know. Two, three, four. Get my fanny pack over here. Five. That was loud. Six. Seven. Ah, I'm just gonna get the last three from over here. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. Oh. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so that's. Oh, different size shells. So it is, oh yeah, so this is seven. So it holds seven. So it, for some reason it takes all nine of those sap caps, but it only takes seven of the regular shells, plus one in the chamber. So it's eight. Interesting. All right, well, let's see if it works. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. I uh, didn't expect it to go that smoothly. So we're gonna put some more through it to just make sure it wasn't a fluke. And if it works, I'll start on the replacing of this silly plastic tube with some wood. So pretty awesome. Who doesn't like an auto eight? <laughs> so what did that do? Okay, so it like double fed there. Hmm. So are these a different length? No, these are exact same length. So something, something double fed there. Interesting. But that seems to work just fine. So basically what happened is it seemed like whatever holds the shells in the tube jiggled under recoil and it tried to double feed those slugs. And these slugs they kick like a son of a gun. So that, that makes sense to me, but cause we just put 18 rounds of buckshot through it and it didn't do that. So anyway, cool. At least I know something, something's jiggling in there. Let's put some more through it. All right. So what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to be better at cataloging everything that's been done. But, uh, yes, yeah, so you can see welded extended tube, 24-inch barrel on a Japanese-made Auto 5 with a 1930s Belgian-made barrel. I don't, don't ask me why, but yeah, Belgian-made barrel, Japanese receiver. <laughs> Bought it like that, who knows. Um, so what we're doing right now, what I'm doing right now is kind of muddling through how exactly I'm going to attach and cut and make these two individual pieces of wood into one piece of wood and i probably just do a, a standard duffel cut repair like on the old military stocks that are that are cut in half or sporterized so i gotta take off material back past this bevel right here on my original handguard right and then this is like a replacement handguard, and it's actually kind of funny. This handguard does actually not does not fit back here, so it has to go up here. And it's kind of built. It's a uh, it's definitely a bigger handguard. It is definitely a cheaper handguard, but still not that cheap because these suckers are like eighty bucks a piece. For this is like a reproduction one too. It's not even an old one. So basically, I gotta do is take the bevel off the front of this and take the bevel off the back of this, and make sure that the right length 
is there so that way when I put it all on there it's literally coming out to just right under these threads so that the cap will squish it all down um and of course uh, duffel cut repair slash splines so what I'll probably do is cut in a table saw with slice into here in the bottom and the side and I'll do that for both of these so that there's basically a three you know lug pattern and then spline it together with wood glue and then clean the splines out from inside here and inside here and that'll be kind of a pain but it will be I'll be able to do it I'll be able to pull it off and then maybe what I'll also do is see about drilling a tiny little hole through here to try to reinforce this section right here since it's the buffer and this is like a 40 year old handguard and then maybe I'll see if I have enough room in here to stick a wood bracer in here above the tube in between the barrel and the tube and put a little metal pin slash reinforcing thing right there on both of these I don't have, and then also if I run something, like a little piece of something in between here, I might have enough material to put some reinforcing pins at the front of this so that we'd have no, like, side-to-side -side torque if there's two, like, metal, like, little finishing nails that poke out that are all glued together with this. Anyway, I'm just kind of spitballing. I'm just kind of figuring it out and uh, kind of... I only want to do this one time because if I screw this up, then I'm replacing expensive wood components, which would be annoying. So, wish me luck, I guess. Uh, measure three times and cry once is what I'm, I'm, or never cry. Measure three times and don't cry is what I'm kind of aiming for. So, we'll see if I can pull that off. But, here we go. Here's my chop saw. Or not mine, but one of the many community tools around here and uh, we're going to try our best to just chop the very bare minimum off the front of this handguard because it can't be used the way it is anymore not really so we just need to cut back past this beveled edge right here to get a 90 degree so that's what we're going to try to do wish me luck We're gonna start small, very small, small cuts, small increments. Okay, so that's the, that was the detent being chopped, that's sparking. So, a little bit more because we're not past that beveled section right there but it looks straight so that's good everything's level <laughs> <laughs> still there so further back it's a little bit steady gone sorry I keep forgetting to try to show you this and it's like probably not in focus but slowly we have a little tiny bit of bevel still left on there so 
One more cut, I think. One more little tiny shave. side I should have taped it probably you know what I might do that right now tape it so we don't get blow out the it blew out on this side out on this side the side it got cut on so I might run some masking tape along this and take off just a smidge more and hopefully not get that blow out we'll try that okay so get rid of that all right, so we'll I guess we'll see. Oop, I just kicked you. Sorry. I guess we'll see if. Uh... Oh God, it's just so expensive for me if I fix if I fuck this up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's on there. Not very happy about the blowouts, but what you gonna do? What you gonna do? Okay. Always buy a replacement if I break things. I guess or not to, but you know what? Learning. Learning. Self-teaching. So, that's now on there. And you can see, I don't know if it's on film, you can see my barely, we're barely getting some of the end of this tube coming out now, so I've taken enough off and there's no bevel on this corner. And these are different, quite different, but I'm hoping with some wood finishing wizardry I can blend these together pretty well so down here is pretty seamless there's a little divot right here but I think honestly it won't be noticeable once I'm done with it and of course it's got these are actually pretty conveniently almost in the exact same place so I'm thinking I can take don't don't get mad at me I think I could take my dremel tool and very carefully just go ee, and kind of blend these two uh i don't know what these are called but these two like things together here but that cut right there seems to be doing exactly what i wanted to do so now i just need to measure four or five million times and start taking material off the back of this handguard and uh i'm going to take the little buffer thing out of this uh that little piece of pipe so I need to measure um, from the edge of these threads to that, and then cut once, cry once type of thing, or cut once and don't cry at all, because I'd be sad if I screw this up, because it'll be expensive. <laughs> uh, I'll see you in a minute. Okay, so I just measured, and I marked my tape measure here. I am just a smidge under 10 and a half. So what would that be? That'd be like 10 and... It's not three quarters because three quarters is right there. So it's like 10 and a smidge. I don't know. I'm really bad at tape measures, but we're woodworking and I'm bad at tape measures. You only live once, right? So, um, <laughs> anyway, my, I'm right under a smidge. I'm right under a smidge of 10 and a half. So I will probably cut a little proud and we'll test fit it off the back and we'll see where we'll go from there. So, uh, yeah, so we'll take be taking this thing and I'll be measuring from my thing. So, uh, okay, I have to do this kind of backwards, I guess. Nope, I can do it like this, okay. So, I'd be cutting off quite a bit of this. So if that's 10 and a half, I think I'll start probably a little probably start at 10 and a half and if I need to take off more I will so that's that's 10 and a half so we're taking off quite a bit here I mean how much is that exactly if I just measured it here how much are we taking off the back of this it's like an inch and three quarters maybe a little bit more than that okay so let's go cut it all right we're back at the chop saw and we're cutting this a little proud because I I'm paranoid I'm gonna screw something up, so and I've done that before. Here we go.
interesting that finish that funky plastic finish on that other handguard uh blows it out on the back but not on this one because this is just this is just oil stain i'm sure or even just it's probably not even stain it's probably just oil straight on wood some walnut or oak or whatever this is so i think it's walnut because it's pretty dark um so i just cut that a smidge proud i'm gonna go to right in front of that line but you know you know the turtle wins the race right turtle wins the race i'm trying to learn this i'm trying to learn this lesson okay <clears throat> the jeremy clarkson way is not the way slow for the win okay so that's just i mean this is already proud i should probably keep going now it's already proud why oh, i cut it i'm doing it at 10 and a half which is more than i need so i should just keep going slow but sure take off just a smidge more here <laughs> Try not to get in your way so you can see what I'm doing here at least. Okay. Oh, okay, we have two. I'm gonna put this back in there so we have some something that kind of sits on. Come on. Ow. Okay. Oh boy. Oh boy. Get some of that sawdust out of those threads so we can screw this on easier. Always better to have things a little bit bigger in this type of wood. In wood, wood is pretty forgiving, but also not forgiving. So, oh boy, here we go. So there's no spring pressure under this, so I can't get this very tight. But it's on there. Oh, there we go. Oh shit! I got crap in the threads. Freaking out here. Don't want to this up I'm trying to be so careful oh it's that detent that detent on the front of this is like super beefy i need some like i wish i had, i need to get some like plastic grippers yeah. so this is not i could probably put a little i can't actually you know what i'll do that i'll probably put a little this this gun's kind of rusty and somebody left it somewhere wet so it's not I'm not like screwing the finish up, it already has finish issues. Okay. Okay. Oh man, it really doesn't want to. That detent is tough, but I got movement on that detent. Shit. That detent is way too stiff, man. Placing this nut anyway with one with a something better, so I don't know. Huh? Can always reblow it or replace it. Probably. Since I'm doing this the stupid way. Get some of this bad, bad boy. Okay. Get a piece of this. Throw that on there. That went beautifully. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, that should be good. Get some gorilla tape on there. Okay. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> well, that didn't work. I thought I was being smart. I thought I was using my head, but I'm not. At least it didn't screw it up more. Okay, why is this? 
stuck on there. So that's gotta be. All right, I'm gonna figure this out. I'll come back. <laughs> so basically, what has happened is that I had, I'm really glad I only cut this to 10 and a half. I probably should have went to like 10 and three quarters. 10 and three quarters. Yeah, that would be... Uh, anyway, whatever. Again, not my forte. Um, so, since I kind of screwed the pooch on the wood bits, I do have a little extra material up here at the front of the magazine tube. Basically, what's happening is this is bottoming out and not indexing in off of the, uh, the detent right there. So, I'm just slowly, with the fi hand file, just hand-fitting this to this. And uh, taking some off, screwing it on there, seeing it's literally millimeters, so I don't want to do this any other way than to hand file. So that's what I'm doing. So I guess you can watch me do that for a second, where I can cut away and show you when I'm done, which I'll probably do that, because me watching you, or having you watch me just do this for a whole lot of time is kind of annoying. So anyway, see you in a bit. All right, so I think I've remedied this. Um, so I basically just, as I said, I took off material from the top of that magazine tube, and now we don't have any play in here, uh, which is nice. So um, I'm going to stop because I don't want to take any more material off of this, and it's not moving, and it's indexed on that cap uh, for the most part, I think. So, uh, anyway, uh, over here, let me see if I can get it over here for you. So it's indexed, I think, pretty good on there. Um, we'll see. Oh, shoot. Okay, so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. But it's not moving back and forth. There's no play between these two pieces of wood anymore, which is nice when this is all cinched down. I might take a little bit more off. I haven't decided yet, but anyway, we'll continue on from here, so... Rolling, rolling, rolling. Well, here we go. All right, so I'm a ways down the line now from where you last I left left yeah, because I've just been busy working. But uh, you can see that this I kind of screwed up. So that side is that deep, and that side is that deep. And you can see there's a pretty good disparity. And I also screwed up the fact that I didn't want to go this far through because this is the buffer for the whole action. But this side I didn't screw up. This side is cut exactly the way I wanted, and I did this one second, can you tell? Second one's always better. So, now I'm sitting here with the little tiny baby finishing file trying to square out the holes in here, since my uh, table saw wasn't a square cut saw head, it was an angle cut, I'll show you right here. So if you're doing splines or you're doing some sort of joint work usually you want to get a square cut tooth and not an angle cut tooth on your blade but i wasn't paying attention so now i have this angled cut in here that i have to file out by hand i've done it on this side already because it was easier you can see squared it out uh, the splines slide in here and uh, these is coco bolo i have a big sheet of coco bolo sitting around here i have a big sheet of coco bolo that I've been cutting splines off of, and they're oversized in the splines. Even this really thin piece, you can see how much, like it is an amazingly stiff piece of wood, even with how thin this is. So the splines will go in here, splines will go on the other side. I'm gonna put another set of splines, or another spline right here. And uh, well, we'll see how it all holds up. But right now I'm in the tedious 
fixing of my mistakes phase. So do things the right way the first time is the lesson here. All right, it's been a really long day of uh, aggravation and learning and, uh, God, so irritating. I'm doing something that was not meant to be done. So here are my splines. So Coco Bolo, spline, right? And this is to, because I screwed up on my cuts, the original cuts, which is why the spline looks like this. Bottom spline, um, cuts there, cuts there, uh, cuts there, and you can see my screwed up from not doing it the right way and uh yeah that's really annoying and then the uh, one on the bottom so anyway and even that's a little crooked i don't know how that happened but it did great well i'll stick it on the gun and show you okay there it is on the gun so splines are in it's on the gun this is on barrel is free to move and it is definitely kind of very custom and definitely not professional but i never said i was so you know what bottom spline it's in so basically this is jammed up against the barrel bottom of the barrel so it can't go any further up in there but it's in there enough and then you'll just saw it off um, when the glue is all dry you'll get rid of all the extra and smooth it out and polish it and all this is really filled with wood glue and uh we're gonna also learn a hard lesson which is at least this moves but i need to kind of keep it in there for like where the barrel needs to be so what we're gonna do is leave as i'm gonna cover the barrel in some grease and then we're gonna wood glue the crap out of this and i'm gonna stick it on and basically use the nut and all of that as like a as the the jig to keep it all in one piece and then uh, it will dry. I'll let it sit for a very extended period of time. And uh, then we'll get into finishing work, which is sanding down all this exposed splining um, and this splining and getting inside of here and cleaning it up and cleaning up some of the, the lips on this, ex this ex bigger handguard out here, down here, and blending it all together and hopefully staining it so it all kind of looks the same. Um, Yes, so we'll see, I guess. See if this works. It's now 12.30 on a Monday night. I have to get up for work at 6 a.m. And this has been stripped. I stripped this of all that uh, shininess. And uh, we're glued it up. So it's in there. I covered the mag tube and the barrel in grease, and I don't think wood glue sticks to metal anyway, but I did that anyway, just in precaution. We got we got it all glued up. I went kind of overkill on the glue because you can never have too much glue. And the nice thing about woodworking and wood glue is you can take it off with sandpaper. So I made some putty too, some wood filler putty out of this tight bond, this tight bond stuff, and the Coco Bolo um sawdust and you basically make putty out of it and shove it into all the cracks um yeah i was going to put some metal reinforcing pins into this but honestly when i had it all dry fit between that coco bolo spline going all the way through here and that coco bolo spine going through there there is there's nothing there's no movement whatsoever so I might put some reinforcing, um, I might put a block of wood right under here with some pins going through it. And at some point I might pin over here, uh, just with some like finishing nails that you grind smooth, um, just to reinforce around where the, the recoil, um, is located on this gun. So, cause it does slam into the back of this and I did weaken this by being a dumbass and drill and cutting too far. Oops. Cutting too far down and just accidentally took out some of my putty over here. Don't do that. So anyway, yeah. So I feel like, so a good example is this is like a hole at the end of the spline that, uh, because I used a angled, uh, table saw, uh, blade it, instead of a square, square tooth, I use an angled tooth. I have an angled, like, hole down here I had to fill. 
So same with up here. Basically, I just have to fill all the cracks. Um, and we're going to let this completely set. It will get a full, like, well, if I right now, say so it'll get a full, like, 15 plus hours at this point. So I'm going to go to bed. And then I'm going to work all day. So that'll probably be, you know, 15 hours from now. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's going. It's going. We're doing it. I'm doing it. So this was a pain in the butt learning experience and a few things that I did that I would do differently. This was definitely a good learning experience because it's kind of a cheap gun. I don't really care about the next one after this that I actually need to do a really professional duffel cut repair is a um, my great great grandfather's 3040 Craig. So and that was poor sporterized, and I got all the stuff to do a duffel cut repair on that, including getting aqua glass and like all the right stuff. We're gonna do that one as right as I can possibly do it because I don't really want to like mess that one up. So <clears throat> we'll see how well this works. Um, I have I'm pretty confident that it's gonna work just fine. So I might stick if we look up in here. I might have some room in here for some pins. Um, if I can pin it up in here, I, I will, because if, you know, more strength is not bad. So, but I didn't really have any room anywhere in here for pins after doing this, this, the splining, how I did it. So anyway, this side is obviously shorter than this side. This spline is really long. This side is not because I, of course I screwed it up. But this side is fine. So, you know, it's actually probably okay. Um, we'll see. I, I don't know. We'll see how it works out. But, uh, yeah. So, we'll sand all this down to, like, and I'll blend all of this together. And blend all this together and blend all, all the bumpy stuff. It looks bad now. But... We're getting there. We're getting there. And, you know, it's it's a cut. It's literally a garage made, you know, Browning Auto 8 or Auto 9 or whatever they call this thing. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, oh, this is another thing I got to do. What are, you, what are you complaining about? It's garage made. So I hand filed the end of this magazine tube down and I didn't do it far enough on this side of the tube. So this nut is kind of crooked. So I'm going to have to continue slowly filing that side down so it flush fits onto this in front of this. But... Yeah, so everything seems to be working okay for now. We'll see. I really hope I don't accidentally glue the, the action into the gun, but this is still moving, which is good. There's not really any glue up here, though. There is some glue probably seepage in here. So I did grease with just, like, r this red bearing grease that tube. So I doubt the wood glue is going to stick to it, but you never know. You never know with this stuff. Yeah, so anyway, tomorrow we'll be finishing work and sanding, and then I'll probably just hit it with some oil and stain. Uh, I have some linseed oil and I have stain, so I'll probably just mix up a little little concoction with that and put a little just dull, you know, matte, more military type finish to that wood end. So stay tuned, and... Good night, because now it's probably close to 1 o'clock in the morning, and I need to go to bed. Okay, it's been quite a long time uh, since this has been drying. It's close to a full 24 hours, a little short of that. And uh, we're going to take off, this is my little, little Japanese saw, and uh, it's hardwood and softwood. So we're going to take off this spline since it's oversized. half of the spline down, make sure I'm this side, make sure I'm still using hardwood, I'm sawing towards my hand, which is a bad idea, don't do that, whatever.
And then I've got some very, this is like the sander pad, it's 120 grit. It's gonna be really cool with those the splines in there of coca bolo with I don't I think this is all the same I think this is like some sort of mahogany or oak or something like that I'm not don't remember exactly but And you can see this is what I'm going to be doing for a while now is just uh, blending. This lip right here is uh, going to go. I'll probably try to blend it as best as I can without taking too much material into the other one on like a nice gradient. We'll see how that goes. And uh, basically, this is just a rough starting of the sanding process. And uh, then we'll go up here. And we'll sand all this out. Sand all this out. You know, like this is like that paste I made. You just start sanding that down. Kind of see what it does here. see slowly but surely just getting that all leveled out and of course since I'm resanding all of this I'll try to stain it all the same um, color and uh, I'll probably just do an oil and stain old school oil finish just a matte oil stain finish of some kind Start rough, 120 grit, and walk our way down my pile of sandpaper. So, yeah, I'll probably have to break the Dremel out to mold these two lines, these two inlets together, and try to get some of this ridge down faster, although it's always bad to take too much material, it's better to go slow. But, yeah, this thing is... Yeah, I don't, I don't see any. It's a good, this is a good test, I guess. Do the, the, uh, the Mark Novak is that his name? The gunsmith test. Ooh, that's bouncy. I need something that this might bounce off of. Hmm. I don't know if I want to try that. <laughs> I probably should. We'll see. If this, if it's broken in the next five seconds, and you see another clip, well, I broke it. All right, I got a little towel here, and this is a good test for if this is one piece, right? And it seems like it's one piece. <laughs> Definitely one piece. So my joint is good, and I don't think it's going anywhere. So, yeah. Progress. Progress, progress, progress. Was this painful? Yes. Was it a learning experience? Oh, most assuredly. This side is not as well lined up with this side. So, which is fine, since this is the side you look at most of the time. But we'll sand the crap out of it. I'll try my best to blend it all together and restain it all one color. And it should look purposeful. But we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Hmm? Anyway, progress. So quite sorry, we're quite a ways down the road from the last place I left you, but uh, here we are. <laughs> it's in one piece again, which is pretty awesome. Um, I've 
restained the forend and blended it as well as I can. And you can see two different styles of wood. This is definitely two different types of wood, but I stained it all somewhat the same. That's definitely lighter, that's definitely darker, but it's one piece and it's stained. I was kind of a donut, absolute donut behavior and busted a, a chunk off of this right here because that's kind of delicate by accident. So now I have a little gap in there because I had to glue that piece on, that little top piece, I lost it, don't know where it went. Great. Um, you can see I've got a gap on the top because, well, these are tapered, like the back one here for the barrel, and this is not tapered for a barrel, so it just has got somewhat of a gap, which it's fine. I think it's fine. So there's nothing in there at all that uh, is important. It's just a gap. In fact, actually, I could put some Skittles in there and uh, have a snack, a snack compartment or some tools or something. You could put something in there and it would sit in there because there's nothing under there, um, except for the magazine tube. That's not true. There's a magazine tube under there. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's all in one piece. And now we just gotta test it like this and see if it works. It worked with my weird PVC spacer. I'm really hoping, you know, it just, it just works. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll see. After I know it works, I'll probably have to either buy an impact, a manual impact driver for this stupid thing, or just take it to a gunsmith and have them take that nut, that bolt screw thing out and take my magazine tube out so that I can actually completely disassemble this gun and clean the bejiggers out of it and re-oil it and uh, put it back together and refinish the stock to kind of match this up here, so... Yeah, uh, it might get another, I might re-stain the back half of this another go tomorrow after this is, this first coat has had some time to cure, so that it kind of goes darker, like the front end, but I don't know, it's definitely custom. Ooh, I dropped you. And uh, it's, it is what it is. It is what it is. And uh, yes. I wanted an A, an auto eight. I have an auto eight. Ingenuity, do it yourself. Can do attitude. See you next time. Okay, okie dokie. We are getting this stupid screw out of the tang because screw the Japanese uh, threading system and their tight tolerances, we're using a manual uh, impact driver, and it's actually working. And I'm totally fucking that screw up, but at this point, I don't care. I don't know if you can really see it coming out. I think you probably can. Oh my god, okay, finally. <laughs> the screw. The screw has caused me, like, PTSD. Trauma. Pain, suffering, annoyance. This is an annoying screw. Holy shit. There wasn't even any thread locker on it. It's just that freaking tight. Why? Why? Well, I've resized it at the same time, so, you know... Whatever. I've also bent up that bit a little bit. <sighs> okay, so all I'm doing right now is taking this gun apart because I finally got the stupid tang screw out. So I'm just taking it all apart and I'm gonna clean it real good and re-oil it because this gun's never been taken apart. Not once. Um, so, and I'm stripping down there. I'm stripping the stock so that I can stain it to match that. And uh, yeah moving right along but yeah you uh, brown nails is a good video on how to strip one of these just so you can clean it and uh, i recommend watching that so anyway uh that's what i'm doing and i'll see you next time i turn this on i figured i'd just show what i use the strip so i'm chemical stripping i know not great but 
that's why it's easiest for me to do right now. So I use Citrus Strip, which is pretty, um, pretty chill for a stripper. Um, it's you can use it indoors, so it doesn't suck like toxic fumes, and it strips pretty well, honestly. So this has been sitting here for like an hour, and I'm just gonna scrape it with my little metal scraper there to get all the shiny varnish off and. We'll stain it and sand it down and make it look like my forend over here, which is, I put another little coat of, um, my stain I'm using is Honey 272. And uh, yeah, I'll put another coat of that on. Should I close that? But yeah, I just put another coat on just to like darken up that back end since it's a lighter wood, so it just blends better. And I re-sanded some bits a little bit. You can see I have a kind of bulge in this. And it's definitely not like, it's not pretty where that joint is. But it was two different types of hand guards being joined together. So one's thinner and one's fatter. If I would have known that, part of fat, I probably would have just got two of the same hand guard. But they're expensive. That hand guard, which is not a nice one, it's just the okay one was like $80. So it's like, eh, whatever. Maybe I feel, if I ever feel. If I ever feel inclined to spend another two hundred dollars, I'll think about redoing that at some point. I don't know. Okay, testing out the custom made. It's really windy, so I don't know if you'll actually hear me. We're testing out this bad boy. So, on the chamber. I'm shooting it with this full handguard on here, so... It's not done, so we'll put some more rounds through it later. But it seems to be functioning pretty good. And a handmade Rhodesian Auto 5. Alright, we're Megan dumping into trash. Gotta do it. Gotta do it. Gotta do it for the homies. You ready? Let's see if I can get the good angle here. You ready, homies? Let's do this thing. Alright, take. Three.
retrospective after the build is done. So, things I've learned, one, I would definitely get two of the exact same handguards. Uh, I would not do two different sizes. Uh, several people have seen this build in person and thought I've done that on purpose. Uh, I did not, but I'll, you know what? I should just pass it off. Oh, I totally did that on purpose. Yeah, I meant to, be, I meant to do that on purpose. One thing about this is that these handguards are tapered for the barrel because the barrel's bigger back here and it gets skinnier down the further it goes. So there's a taper right here in the wood that's meant for back here. So there's this funky gap right here and you can probably kind of see the black right there against the barrel. That's a, a funky gap. And I mean, it works, it doesn't matter. Uh, at all functionality wise uh, i was kind of a donut and totally busted a little bit off of that back hand guard right there which is just stupid so now i have this little chip on that side but what are you gonna do um i the magazine tube i definitely probably should have taken the magazine tube out of the gun for the welding I didn't do that because I knew that there was some funky Loctite or something on the threads for this gun, uh, according to the internet with the Japanese guns. I don't know if that's true or not, but I, it's in there. It is in there. So I was just like, you know, I don't feel like trying to unthread the magazine tube. So I left it in there for the welding, which made it a little hard to make sure it was perfectly lined up. So the magazine tube is, it took a lot of internal sanding to get it to function reliably. Um, I'm still messing, I'm still dealing with that weird malfunction, which is, uh, I haven't put a whole lot of rounds through it since the last video because 12 gauge <laughs> buckshot and slugs are expensive. But um, I haven't put enough through it to see if it will do that again or if it's just like a break-in thing, I don't know. Since I really did kind of rebuild the gun. Um, but the kind of where it shoves two shells into the action I think that's because my magazine tube spring, which is a Wolf Extra Power spring, is oversized for the amount of shells that I'm putting in the magazine tube. The magazine tube only holds seven actual shotgun shells, unlike the test video where it ate all of my snap caps, but it only likes seven actual shotgun shells. So seven plus one, but every once in a while, I'll just try to shove two shells into the action. That might just be because the spring is overpowered mixed with the recoil is shoving two shells into the action at the same time causing a malfunction. Now I probably will just take a wire cutter out to the range and a couple boxes of shells and throw shells through it to make sure and then trim the spring down as I go disassemble the gun, trim the spring down, a couple uh, loops off the spring, put it back in there, load it up, make sure that it will feed shells without being so as stiff, it is, as stiff as it is, because I think that the spring is too stiff, and I think that it's got too much oomph behind it, especially once it starts getting to the end of the, the tube as shells keep going in, out, out, out. It's got a lot of oomph. Um, so I probably need to deal with that. Um, obviously the end of my magazine tube is kind of, is kind of screwy over here because of, uh, having to hand file my mistake with measuring the overall length of the handguard. Um, that was, you know, the biggest thing with this is the whole uh, measure once, you know, cry once, measure once mentality of, or measure three times and don't cry at all, you know, whatever that mentality is of make sure the math is actually like on point because if the math's not on point, it's off. You have to compensate, which I learned the hard way several times through this compassing pretty heavily for the for my mistakes <clears throat> and so yeah definitely those those mistakes uh buying all of the gunsmithing tools so i bought a full set of screwdriver bits for guns especially these brownings which have all the really 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 fine um thread or really fine head flatheads getting an impact driver for that rear tang screw back here um that was all stuff I needed to get anyway, just because I have other things, projects and whatever that need probably proper gun screwdriver bits, but that is a cost that's kind of crazy. The inspiration behind this was obviously a few years ago at this point, I want to say I had to look at the video again. A Forgotten Weapons did a, a video on a custom 
Remington Model 11 that Van Comp made him. Um, and I thought about <laughs> I thought about breaking this all back down again and painting this gun in like Rhodesian baby poop because you <laughs> you only live once, right? And <laughs> They, this finish on it isn't really that nice. I mean, there's like no finish left on that barrel. That barrel's like a hundred years old and there's no finish left on it. And the receiver got left somewhere kind of wet. So there is some like weird pitting in the bluing. So the gun probably needs to be refinished anyway. So rattle canning it, baby poop, like camo, <laughs> wouldn't hurt its value. But I think some people probably cry if I did that. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, yeah, one thing I didn't film with the project was the sling attachment points. I just kind of forgot to do that, but I basically just went to eBay and found some a Browning uh, Auto 5 sling swivel magazine tube cap, which this cap actually indexes off of the detent on this front handguard way better than the, the factory one. So it actually worked out pretty good. Um, and then I just used an old duck cloth M1 carbine sling that I had hanging out and I put that on there. And uh, it worked out pretty good. I basically rigged it up exactly like Ian's from Forgotten Weapons is rigged up from back here to the bottom of that, you know, that grip down there. Oops, sorry. Bottom of that grip down there. And, uh, you know, I was thinking maybe I would port the barrel because it'd be kind of fun to port the barrel, put some ports in this. But I don't know if I got the guts for that. I got a drill press. I could probably rig up some you know, jig to hold the barrel in place while I ported it, but mm, I don't know, That might I might try that, we'll, we'll see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it turned out pretty good. I, there's still some little eh, things I need to deal with, but you know, old gun, uh, got it from old, old dude, the guy from a estate sale, didn't know anything about it really. Uh, I feel like I got a good deal on it, and I have a, I have an Auto 8 for under what they, I think they were originally imported in the early 90s, early 2000s, or mid 90s, early 2000s, in very small numbers, and I think they were like $900 when they were first imported, and that's pretty, that's, pretty, that's a lot of money for like 1997 or something, or, or 2003, but, um, <clears throat> I am under that $900 for this project. Minusing, even with the tools, I'm probably under it, even with the tools I bought. Yeah, this, so this gun is under, even with all the screwdriver bits and the weird tools. I already had a lot of woodworking stuff, so I didn't have to really buy any of that. But all the parts, plus that, plus the tools, yeah, I'm still, un I'm probably $100 under that $900 importation cost back in the early neighborhood. So it's probably cost me like 800 bucks. I did the I did the labor myself. I like calculated it out because somebody asked, like, oh, could you make another one of these? I'm like, yeah, sure, I could I could make another one. Maybe my brother could weld up another tube and we could totally make another one of these. Now the problem is <clears throat> if I paid my brother, he just did it for me. But if I paid him, what do you actually need to be paid for the amount of work that we did to do this? I mean, it's like 150 bucks a time, $75 an hour. It took a couple hours to weld that tube together because of the math and the, the tediousness of it. So it's 150 bucks there. You're you're paying the same hourly rate. You know, 75 is low. I mean, it's more money now than $75. It's like more like 100 plus dollars an hour. But like the same hourly rate for custom woodwork is the same rate. So. You're spending 160 to 200 dollars on hand guards for me to figure out how to melt, glue them together in a strong, like, stable way, and it would probably be, you know, I think it took me like eight, nine hours to make that stupid hand guard um, because I was just like constantly fiddling with the math and putting it on, taking it off, and sanding. Yeah, it, it was. So if you paid me to do that, it's like a eight hundred dollar to a thousand dollar handguard and that one's super janky and super not professionally made i'd love to do another one just to get better at it but um there's no way anybody would pay me <laughs> especially since you're also buying an auto five that you don't care about like screwing with this auto five because it's kind of this weird hodgepodge like duck gun um it was only 450 bucks I don't, I don't think you can find actual browning 
auto fives for that cheap anymore. I got really lucky because I have local classifieds near me. And I can jump on a local classified and like look at the gun tabs and look at the shotgun tab and just flip through and see every week what new stuff comes up for sale locally to me. And um, that's not a lot of people have access to that. So finding a cheap weird guns to like screw with is hard. But I'd love to do another weird project of this. Next project I think down the line I have would be I have my great great grandfather's 3040 Craig that got sporterized. And I got all the stuff. Actually, I have a piece of wood right here. I got all the stuff to um, put it back to its original military configuration. So there's the front end um, to re uh, duffel cut repair. You can see it's oversized a little bit over here. It's too long. It's longer than it needs to be. And uh, yeah, to like do the duffel cut repair for this on a 3040 Craig, I think would be really, really cool. So, and I've, about, I've had that Craig for like 10 years, and it's always just been this weird sporterized thing. I put like uh, maybe a couple rounds through a year because 3040 Craig ammo, that stuff, expensive. Um, I'm trying to reload for it because I'm, they're going to pay me like 250 cents a round for that. Um, but yeah, cool project. Definitely could do another one. Definitely have to have somebody that's willing to spend the money and. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, look forward to the next project, and yeah, thanks uh, thanks for sticking around. This is a long one. This is a tedious uh, bootleg Mark Novak, or uh, Anvil Gunsmithing, or whatever that page is called. I'm trying to remember. I think I got those names right. But yeah, I'm just bored, and uh, technically minded, and uh, don't like spending too much money on things, and I know I can do them myself. So, try things. Come well-rounded, read books, build stuff.